the number one thing for healthy aging, maintain your muscle mass. I'm 72 years old, so I'm a good example of people that can get into CrossFit even at an elderly age and really compete and, and exercise hard and maintain your physical fitness in the old age. And over time, if you exercise and do strength training regularly, you're getting more mitochondria in every cell in your body. Hello and welcome back to episode number 106 of High Intensity Health Radio. I'm your host, Mike Munzel, and this is brought to you by HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks for tuning in, and today we're live with Ross Pelton. He's a registered pharmacist and a certified clinical nutritionist. He also has a PhD in nutrition, and he's authored more than 10 books, some of which we're going to talk about today, including The Pill Problem, How to Protect Your Health from the Side Effects of Oral Contraceptives, and Nutritional Cost of Prescription Drugs, which he co-authored with a best-selling author, uh, Jim Laval, as well. So, uh, Ross, thanks so much for being on the program. Hey, Mike. It's nice to be with you and your listeners and your viewers. Awesome. Well, it's great to be with you. I know we've been in email contact for several years now, so it's nice to actually uh, be chatting with you uh, in uh, video here. Now, let's kind of dive into how you got into this. You've been you know, in this industry for quite some time. Is there any you know, kind of key events or, or any uh, people that you met that got you interested in more of a, a natural approach to pharmacy and uh, integrative medicine? Well, Mike, for a long time, I was a standard American diet sort of guy, uh, fast foods and uh, not into health. And in 1979, I had a life-changing event. Um, just on a fluke, I happened to stick my head in the door where I heard some strange music and I saw a yoga class in session. And I got connected to yoga. And through yoga... I started befriending people that were interested in health and they read health books and health magazines and health newsletters and they ate healthy food and they exercised regularly. And so I started to associate with these people and I just started to absorb health related information like a sponge. And I realized with my background as a pharmacist and my studies in medicine and science, I had the background and the capability to understand all this health related information. And it just made sense. And so for the last 30 or 40 years, I have been somewhere between passionately and neurotically mm -hmm. um, chasing after this health information, and it never stops. I mean, the, with technology expanding at the rate it is, uh, there's just more and more to learn and more and more to, to teach, and so that's my passion. And so I've been a pharmacist uh, professionally because I'm addicted to paying my mortgage, <laughs> but my passion is everything related to health, and so that's uh, um, how I got started, and I started to learn things and integrate them into my life, and then I started to read uh, um, more and more and started to create seminars and lectures, and then I started writing books, and um, that's been my passion. Uh, anything related to health, I'm interested in it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And let's talk about those books. You've authored more than 10 books, uh, one of which I have, The Nut Nutritional Cost of Drugs, which is a fantastic book that I think you co-authored with uh, James, James Laval. So maybe let's talk yeah. about some of the books and, and, and transition to, to some of your most recent work and maybe yeah. talk about the top medications and, and kind of how they affect our nu nutrient status. Sure. Well, the first book I wrote was um, Mind, Food, and Smart Pills. It was the first book ever written on intelligence enhancing drugs and nutrients and the prevention of brain aging. There's about eight or nine people that have written books on that now, So, it, um, but I was the first guy that wrote about that topic, and that was the thesis for my PhD, actually. And uh, then I got into uh, things related to cancer. I worked for the Gerson Therapy for a while as a consultant, and then I moved to Mexico, and for six years, I was the hospital administrator of one of the world's largest alternative non-toxic cancer hospitals in Mexico, down in Baja. And out of that experience, I wrote Alternatives in Cancer, which is a Simon & Schuster book. And then my wife and I and another friend co-authored How to Prevent Breast Cancer, another Simon & Schuster book. Um, and after that, the next step along the way, I wrote the Drug-Induced Nutrient Depletion Handbook, and along with Jim Laval. And that has become kind of a, a classic reference book for physicians and pharmacists and other health professionals, teaching them what nutrients are being depleted by the drugs they're prescribing. And then Jim and I discussed this topic, and we realized that all health professionals, unfortunately, are not going to get our reference book. So we rewrote the book as the nutritional cost of drugs, which was more focused for the general public. 
and it went into more detail about the importance of nutrients and the health problems that are associated with the nutrient depletions caused by the drugs that are pe people are taking. And as you know, millions and millions of people are taking medications that develop nutrient depletions, um, partially because there's nutrient deficiencies in the standard American diet and high stress lifestyles and reliance on fast foods. So you've got all of those problems going on. Then you go to a doctor and they prescribe a drug which you expect is going to help you and it creates more nutrient depletions which can just be the straw that broke the camel's back and then people start to get symptoms because of nutrient depletions they go to the doctor and get another drug when they really need to be taking some appropriate nutrients to prevent or overcome these health problems so that's um, been a big step along the way when i started to get into the whole topic of the nutrients that are depleted by the drugs that people are taking Oh, and awesome. then I wrote The Pill Problem, which teaches women how to prevent the side effects from birth control pills, because I was astounded when I wrote the Drug-Induced Nutrient Depletion Handbook. Oral contraceptives are the largest class of commonly prescribed drugs that deplete the most nutrients. So these tens of millions of women that are taking oral contraceptives don't realize all the nutrients that are being depleted. And one of the examples I use when I'm giving presentations, think about the woman that's been taking oral contraceptives for maybe six or seven or eight years, seemingly without any problems. But along the way, these birth control pills are depleting, depleting vitamin B12 and folic acid and coenzyme Q10 and magnesium, which is all required for energy production. And so after seven or eight years, she starts to complain to her spouse or her significant other, honey, I've got no energy. I, I'm just dragging. I, I can hardly get out of bed in the morning. Or by mid-afternoon, I can't put one foot in front of the other. She's likely to not connect the dots and realize it's her oral contraceptives causing the nutrient depletions, which are creating all these energy problems. So that's just an example of what happens. Um, and in most cases, one of the frustrating things is that these nutrient depletions have a gradual onset of action. So people don't realize that the drugs are causing nutrient depletions, creating problems. Because in most cases, when a physician prescribes a drug and there's a side effect, you either get nausea or a skin rash, and it happens fairly quickly. So you say, this is not good, and the doctor changes the dose or changes the drug. But these nutrient depletions caused by drugs are gradual over time, and they cause a lot of problems that people don't connect the dots. They're not aware of their drug causing the problem. Mm -hmm. um, if I could wave my magic wand, I think that we should have one of the primary requirements for a drug that is approved by the FDA the drug company should be forced to do studies on nutrient depletions as part of the drug approval process. But that doesn't happen. So that's kind of been my path and how I moved along uh, with different areas of health that I got interested in and started to write about. Fantastic, Ross. Thanks for breaking that down so eloquently. And a question came to mind. Is it, is it the bioactives in the medicines that are causing the depletions or is it the excipient components, maybe, you know, the titanium dioxide? There's a lot of flowing agents and, you know, phthalates and endocrine disrupting chemicals often used in the pharmaceutical manufacturing process. So um, do we know what exactly is de causing these nutrient depletions? Is it the bioactives or the, those excipients? Nobody's really researched that. And in many cases, when there are nutrient depletions, the way it gets reported is some savvy, alert clinician starts to realize that eight or ten of his clients that are taking the same drug are reporting the same type of symptoms. And so they'll do a small little evaluation with a few patients that are taking the drug and look at a similar group of control patients that aren't taking the drug, and they report an observation. And they say the people taking this drug have lower vitamin B6 and uh, lower tyrosine and higher rates of depression, but there's no mechanism of action that's reported. They don't know why it's happening. But in many cases, these drugs are uh, influencing 
absorption of nutrients or enzymes that are involved in activity. There's multiple possible mechanisms of action, but in many cases, we don't understand the mechanism of action. It's just an observation that's reported. And we say the group of people that are taking this drug have lower levels of specific nutrients and they have these side effects or health problems associated with the nutrient depletions, but we don't exactly know why. Mm -hmm. That's scary stuff. And I agree with what you said there, that drug companies should be forced to, you know, really study the nutrient depletions caused by these medications, just like chemical companies should really look at, you know, whether long, the long-term uh, ramifications of being exposed to these various chemicals, but we know the chemical companies don't do that. And drug companies probably yeah. will not do that. Yep. And there's, I think there's 10,000 different chemicals produced in the United States every year only 1,500, no, excuse me, the figure is 70,000. There's 70,000 different chemicals manufactured in the United States every year. Only 1,500 have been studied for toxicity. So it's a huge problem. I mean, just things like glyphosate and Roundup. I mean, that is probably one of the worst crimes against humanity that's ever been perpetrated. And it's hard to get Monsanto to stop, and it's hard to, to get enough groundswell of scientific information to force a change, but it's really a huge, huge problem. Yeah, certainly is. Yeah, and these these compounds, these chemical compounds, like you mentioned, very few are tested for for how toxic they really are in humans, and and they they're looking at lethal dose, you know, LD fifty levels, which means you know how much of a certain substance is going to actually kill you or you know kill an animal that's being studied. But we know that it's not just about you know causing death; it's more about how it perturbs our metabolism. And then more importantly, these compounds are not studied uh, in synergistic fashion. You know, we're all exposed to multiple different types of chemicals. So that's pretty scary stuff there, Ross. Now let's go back to the birth control, uh, if, if you don't mind, and, and kind of talk about how that affects energy and also mood. We know that a lot of women you know, suffer from anxiety, uh, depression, mood disorders, and I th believe, and maybe you can correct and, and expand on this, a lot of that is linked from consumption or taking birth control pills, is it not? Absolutely. And birth control pills deplete vitamin B6, vitamin b6 is required for serotonin production so most of the women taking oral contraceptives are going to have disruption and inhibition of their serotonergic pathway and we've also found out that women taking oral contraceptives have lower levels of tyrosine tyrosine is the precursor for dopamine and norepinephrine so both of these critical neurotransmitter pathways are interrupted or inhibited by birth control pills which means women are more likely to be depressed when they're on birth control pills. And there's numerous studies now that document that women who are taking birth control pills have several times higher rates of depression and anxiety compared to women who are non-users or have never taken birth control pills. So we know this is going to happen. And the side effects from antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs are horrible, brutal. And most people don't understand that. And in animal studies, it shows that these drugs at human equivalent doses are causing brain damage. Mm -hmm. um, if they sacrifice animals that are taking human equivalent doses of Prozac, they find out that 40 to 60% of their serotonin receptors are gone. Wow. And the drug companies have a slick term, they call it down regulation. I call it brain damage. <laughs> and, and, if you stop taking the antidepressant, we don't know if these receptors come back. The drug companies won't do that test because if they find out that these receptors don't come back, they'll have the biggest class action suit in the history of the world on their hands, and so they don't want to go there. But yes, women are much more likely to be depressed uh, when they start taking anti uh, birth control pills. So, And my whole book on the pill problem teaches women what the nutrient depletions are from birth control pills. And I realize many women have to take birth control pills because of lifestyle and jobs and so forth. Um, so learn what nutrients are depleted so you can overcome or compensate for these nutrient depletions and hopefully have a healthy life and still take birth control pills and not have endless numbers of children. Mm -hmm. 
Well, how bad is the you know, talk about other options here? I mean, there's a copper IUD and then, you know, different planning and looking at your um, ovulatory cycle and then, you know, having intercourse around that. Uh, what do you think is the least invasive uh, and probably best? Well, approach? the least invasive is the rhythm method, <laughs> but um, many people can't rely on that. A lot of women do okay with an IUD, but I encourage women if they do an IUD, be very, very observant of how you're feeling and how you're doing because there are some women that have reactions to them and they really sh need to be removed. Mm -hmm. But um, spermicidals work fairly well. Um, and of course, condoms are an option. Um, but birth control pills, these hormones are very, very powerful chemicals. And if you stop to think about it, the, the great creator in all of his or her infinite wisdom never intended women to put these powerful steroid hormones in their mouth and into their gastrointestinal tract. For 99.99% of human evolution, no woman ever put these hormones in her mouth and into her digestive tract. And my theory is that these very powerful chem chemicals uh, harm the sensitive receptors in the gastrointestinal tract, and that causes a problem with absorption of nutrients. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's probably what's happening, but nobody really knows for sure. Um, but birth control pills deplete all of the B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, B6, B12, folic acid, and they deplete magnesium and um, they deplete selenium, which is a critical antioxidant nutrient, and coenzyme Q10 is depleted, and tyrosine is depleted. So there's this wide range of nutrients that are depleted by oral contraceptives, and my passion is that women need to know this. Mm, sure. And in most cases, doctors are not telling them, and they think that we'll just go on the pill. And so, and millions of women with acne problems are put on the pill to control their acne. That drives me crazy. Huh. Or they're given antibiotics to control their acne, which also drives me crazy. <laughs> There's a lot of things out there that are really harming the, the life and the health of women. Yeah, it's a tough world, not to mention the cosmetics and then, huh. you know, yeah. arsenic uh, all over playgrounds. I mean, there's so many different sources now. It's, it's pretty frightening when you actually you know, start diving into it. But Ross, you mentioned magnesium, B12, folate. I mean, these are, uh, and CoQ10. Uh, in my opinion, I mean, if we added zinc to that list, those would be some of the critical nutrients that you definitely don't want to deplete and uh, because they're involved in so many different functions, but most importantly, cognition and you know, memory and plasticity and having a, a good, healthy mood and neurotransmission and so forth. So maybe let's kind of talk about how these deficiencies affect neurochemistry leading to anxiety and depression. Well, the, the, all those nutrients that you mentioned there are involved in energy production, and the brain, uh, along with the heart, are the most energy-demanding organs in the body. So you're going to impact negatively energy production at the cellular level, which means you're going to have a negative influence in the way messages are sent along the neurons in your brain chemistry. And so there's, there's cognitive issues also along the way. If you, Vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiencies definitely have a, a negative impact on cognition. Um, in fact, in the elderly, a lot of people with early onset Alzheimer's disease symptoms are really suffering from a vitamin B12 deficiency. And um, sometimes a weekly injection of vitamin B12 intramuscularly makes a dramatic change in um, improvement in cognition and cognitive function in the elderly. Um, and how many of these early onset Alzheimer's disease patients have been women who were on birth control pills for 15 or 20 years? I mean, it's, it's a lot of contributing factors, but you're also right. The, the environmental toxins are just a huge, huge issue these days, and people have no idea the multitude of exposures they're getting. And so you need to take steps to improve your health and your immune system and your detoxification capabilities. Yeah. And what have you found to be effective for that? We'll, we'll get back to some of the micronutrients and cognition, but since you ended there, I would love to kind of explore that further. Um, I've seen some good studies with Hatha yoga and hot yoga and the sweating can help with elimination. Um, what do you talk to people about preventing accumulation and also enhancing elimination? 
Well, you've touched on one of my favorite topics. Um, the most important thing for detoxification is elevating your levels of glutathione. Glutathione is not only the master antioxidant, it's also the master detoxifier in our systems. And up until now, we really haven't been able to effectively take glutathione. If you take it orally, it gets broken down and, and destroyed uh, by the metabolism, and, or it gets oxidized and, and is no longer functional. But there's a new strain of probiotics called Lactobacillus fermentum ME3, and we call it ME3 for short. And Lactobacillus fermentum ME3 produces glutathione in humans. So now we can take a probiotic that's producing glutathione 24 hours a day. And in some human clinical trials of people taking ME3, there's a substantial reduction in oxidized LDL cholesterol, which means you're lowering cardiovascular risk. And there's also lower levels of eight isoprostanes, which is another marker of free radical damage uh, related to unsaturated fats. And there's a 49% increase in the ratio of reduced glutathione to oxidized glutathione. So you're dramatically increasing your levels of active glutathione, 26% increase in total antioxidant activity. So this new probiotic, Lactobacillus fermentum ME3, is, I think, a, a game changer in health and medicine, being able to significantly increase your glutathione levels, which means You'll detoxify heavy metals like cadmium and arsenic and mercury, and you'll detoxify organophosphates and um, some of the other agricultural pesticides and insecticides. Glutathione is required for alcohol metabolism. Glutathione is required for the metabolism of Tylenol or acetaminophen, which is the number one cause of liver failure. Um, in fact, all prescription drugs and many of the over-the-counter drugs are all requiring glutathione for detoxification. So glutathione gets depleted. And then you build up more toxins and you have more free radical damage and you accelerate your aging process. So one of my really interesting stories these days is that there's now a probiotic that people can take, um, take a dose of probiotics containing lactobacillus fermentum ME3. You're getting 6 billion bacteria that are little glutathione manufacturing plants. And so I think this is a real breakthrough in our ability to improve our detoxification and our antioxidant protection and our long-term health. Oh, that's so fascinating, Ross. We'll have to put those uh, studies in the show notes at highintensityhealth.com slash Ross, because that's really fascinating stuff. And, and I haven't heard about this particular strain of uh, bacteria, but it's really unique, you know, where the, the industry is going when it comes to, um, you know, taking probiotics. And we know that it's really the strain specific effects and how different bacterial strains, not just say lactobacillus acidophilus or lactobacillus fermentum, whatever it is, it's the strain and that number that you mentioned right. afterwards. Exactly. Like Lactobacillus acidophilus, there's 128 strains of it. And strains of bacteria are as unique as individuals. Humans are unique. And so you have to know that the research has been done on a specific strain in your probiotic. And they're finding out that multi-strain multi probiotics are much more effective than single strain because all the bacteria are different. So if you take a a probiotic has got eight or 10 or 12 different strains. You're getting a lot of different activity from the different strains. And but the, the Human Microbiome Project is just exploding research in uh, probiotics. And in fact, I just made a slide for a presentation from a gentleman that did a presentation at the Microbiome Conference in Europe in March. And he stated that probiotics in the intestinal tract are now known to have over 20 thousand different individual functions so they're controlling everything our microbiome is one of the most critical things for good health and good longevity mm -hmm. and healthy brain function that i've mentioned here lactobacillus fermentum me3 it's got an interesting history and an interesting story it was discovered in 1995 when scientists were surveying a wide range of probiotics looking for probiotics that had antioxidant activity well, this particular strain was isolated from the intestinal tract of a healthy one-year-old child. And when they tested this particular strain, 
its antioxidant activity was just off the charts. It was astounding. So from 1995, now they've spent 20 years studying this strain, Lactobacillus fermentum ME3, trying to learn how and why it provides such amazing antioxidant activity. And they've discovered now that it produces glutathione and it actually boosts glutathione levels by three different mechanisms. It, the bacteria themselves can synthesize it. The bacteria can extract glutathione from the surrounding environment if it's available. And the bacteria will also recycle oxidized glutathione back to its active reduced form. So there's three different mechanisms by which lactobacillus, lactobacillus fermentum ME3 increases glutathione levels. And this is never, there's nothing that's ever been discovered before that does this. So they're calling ME3 a complete glutathione system. And <laughs> uh, along with its antioxidant capability with glutathione, ME3 also produces manganese superoxide dismutase, which is another really critical intracellular antioxidant. And there's a group of antioxidant enzymes called peroxinases, and peroxinases specifically detoxify organophosphates and other agricultural pesticides. And ME3 upregulates the activity of these enzymes. So there's a multitude of ways that lactobacillus fermentum ME3 really improves overall health. And ME3 is so far beyond the traditional concept of a probiotic that we think about for gastrointestinal health. We're calling ME3 a broad spectrum biological probiotic. It mm -hmm. uh, has it actually affects every single cell in your body because glutathione affects every single cell in your body. Glutathione is made inside the cells and its main job is to provide antioxidant protection to all the components inside every cell in your body. Glutathione really protects more of your body than all the other antioxidants combined. So glutathione is a critical, critical compound in our bodies for health and longevity. And now we've got a probiotic that will produce it 24 hours a day. Mm, gosh, that's it's fascinating. It's a fairly significant breakthrough. That's huge. Yeah, that's amazing. But what's also exciting is you talked about the peroxamases and the organophosphates. And um, I think a lot of people are familiar with phthalates and BPA, but organophosphates is, is for some people, it's kind of that gray area. They don't know a lot of research about it, but it's linked with anxiety, ADD, ADHD, ADD in kids, and uh, even diabetes. I saw a study. So maybe talk to us about organophosphates and what are some other ways that we can upregulate these peroxamases? Yeah. Organophosphates, Mike, are one of the most widely used pesticides and insecticides in agriculture, uh, but it's also widely used residentially in lawns and gardens and so forth, and, and it's terribly neurotoxic. And it's very, very serious when younger children get exposed to it because they're developing brains and nervous systems aren't equipped to, to handle it yet. And so it's much more damaging when young kids get exposed to it. And in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the NHANES National Nutrition Survey, 2003-2004, 93% of children examined had metabolites of one or more organophosphates. So all these kids are getting exposed to it. And we think about autism, and we think about ADHD, and all these cognitive function and neurological problems that kids are having, well, I think exposure to things like organophosphate um, pesticides and insecticides are a big issue. And I caution people, yes, it's good to scrub your fruits and vegetables before you eat them, but that's not really preventing you getting exposed to these because it's in the food. And so this is why I encourage people to shop organic and support your organic farming is industry because that's the way to avoid these uh, exposures to pesticides and insecticides and herbicides and fungicides and all these things that are used throughout the agricultural industry and commercial food production. That's fantastic. And uh, one of the co one of my favorite co-ops, actually, Ross, is in your hometown there, uh, Ashland. So one of the a great places, you know, if you're wondering, like, where can you get awesome organic food? Pretty much every city in America now has, uh, you know, a network of co-ops that you can find uh, locally produced organic food. So, Ross, do you shop there at the Ashland Co-op? I shop there. I just gave a presentation there a couple of weeks ago. 
And uniquely, the Ashland Food Co-op has the highest dollar volume squares per square foot of any health food grocery store in the United States. It's won the Oscar, the equivalent of the Oscar in the health food and organic grocery industry for being the top organic health food grocery store. So it's very unique that in a little town of 20,000 here in the Rogue Valley in Southern Oregon, we got the best organic health food grocery store in the world. <laughs> it's one of the best. So Ross, I don't know if you know this, but I travel quite frequently. I was just like in New York and Chicago and Milwaukee the last two weeks. And I'm a kind of Whole Foods, uh, you know, co-op kind of geek. So I'll go to all the different natural food stores for lunch and dinner and try and figure out like, you know, who's doing cool stuff and, you know, what they're offering in, in different food selection. And the Ashland co-op is one of my favorites by far. I've been like all over the West Coast, Colorado, y- Utah, Idaho, everywhere. And it's by far one of one of the best. So for folks listening, if you haven't been there and you're in Southern Oregon uh, or even Northern California driving through there, uh, definitely stop in and check that out because it's a wonderful yeah. store. Next time you're in Ashland, Oregon, you connect with me and we'll hang out. Well, yeah, we can do a little recording there or something, huh? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> That's great. So thanks for clarifying all the details on organophosphates. And maybe let's circle back a little bit to kind of what you're focusing on now and helping people understand natural solutions to overcome anxiety and depression. And uh, based upon yeah. what we've talked about so far, anything we didn't cover uh, in terms of helping mood and cognition? Well, that's a big topic for me. I, I'm really passionate about educating people that there are safe, effective therapies for depression and anxiety, natural therapies that work. And as a pharmacist, I'm also deeply involved in the problems associated with the prescription drugs, the antidepressants and the anti-anxiety drugs. They literally change the brain. They change the architectural structure of the brain as well as the biochemistry of the brain. And these are long-term problems that don't go away by just stopping the drug. Um, So it's very difficult for people to discontinue these antidepressants and anti-anxiety drugs because once the brain and the receptor sites in the brain change, you're essentially addicted to the drugs. When people try to stop these drugs, there's a horrible rebound depression or anxiety and they can't get off the drugs. I think that antidepressant and anti-anxiety drugs are the slickest form of legalized drug addiction that's ever been invented. It's really a horrible, horrible story. And I spent a lot of time with private consultations with clients setting up programs to have so that they can learn how to gradually decrease their dosages and start to integrate natural therapies for depression and anxiety so that they can effectively get off these drugs and kind of switch over to the natural therapies. But there are many effective natural therapies for depression and anxiety. And in my four hour online seminar, I go through everything in a great deal of detail. Um, And along with talking about things like 5-HTP and vitamin B6, and tyrosine, which are the primary precursors for serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. I also talk about B6, B12, folic acid, SAMe, S-adenosylmethionine, which are methyl donors, which are critical for the production of the neurotransmitters. And there's a lot of herbal agents that have some really good effects. But I also get into things like artificial sweeteners and sugar, And there's some good long-term studies that show that people that drink more soft drinks and consume more sugar end up with three to four times greater levels of depression. And there's significant studies uh, comparing health-oriented diets with the commercially available food supply. People that are on junk food diets end up having much higher rates of depression and anxiety. So those are critical issues. So I get the lifestyle things exercise duh and (laughs) there are a lot of natural therapies that are effective for anxiety and depression mild to moderate anxiety and depression not too many natural therapies are effective for major depression exercise is an incredibly effective natural therapy to treat even major depressive disorder i've never known anybody that went out and exercised and they came back and said Oh, 
bummer. I wish I hadn't done that. You always feel better when you exercise. If you can just get up off that couch and do it, it really makes a big difference. Yeah. And I, I know you're a big fan of exercise. You're pretty physically fit yourself. So you're on the same page with this. One of the studies I present in my lectures and seminars, there was a group of scientists, gerontologists in Italy that surveyed a large group of healthy elderly people to find out what was the number one thing for healthy aging. The concept was instead of looking at sick people that get sick and trying to figure out why they got sick, here's a group of healthy elderly people. Why don't we try to figure out what they did to stay healthy into their old age? So they did a wide, they, hundreds of things, all the blood parameters, diet, lifestyle, nutrition, work environment, home environment, relationships. The number one thing for healthy aging, maintain your muscle mass. And in order to maintain your muscle mass, you got to do some form of strength exercises, weightlifting, resistance exercise. You got to do something to gain and maintain your muscle mass or you'll lose it. And so that's the number one thing for healthy aging, some type of resistance or um, physical training with weights and, and increase the weights and do more resistance. And um, I'm passionately involved in CrossFit. I'm an a CrossFit addict, and um, nice. I just uh, encourage people. And I'm 72 years old, so I'm a good example of people that can get into CrossFit even at an elderly age and really compete and and exercise hard and maintain your physical fitness into old age. Mm. Well, Ross, I was going to ask you what you do for physical fitness because your cognition is, you are on point. You, you are just firing off words and concepts and synthesizing things into beautiful sentences that people can really take action on. So uh, whatever you're doing, it's really working. So I commend you for that. And, and just want to talk about exercise a little bit. And I think people you know, know all the benefits of exercise. But one thing that's so important is exercise is one of these keystone habits. When you start exercising, you start eating better. You know, you're going to choose healthier foods. You're going to hang out with healthier people. Uh, you're going to be tired. So you're going to create that sleep craving and that, that, that kind of sleep pressure uh, as past guests, um, Dr. Eric Balkovash talked about. So there's so many different benefits to exercise in addition to just, you know, keeping uh, trim and lean, like you mentioned, the metabolism aspect and so forth. And uh, what I found with exercise, and I would love to hear kind of your experience is you get, uh, you know, a mild sense of euphoria when you start to really kind of break down muscle tissue and exercise intensely and create, uh, you know, various um, endorphins and things of that sort. So what are some of the neurochemical aspects of exercise, if you will? Well, there's a couple of things, Mike. Um, when you do resistance exercise, you force your muscles to build more mitochondria. So when you have more mitochondria in your muscles, you have more energy available. So that's one of the most critical things. Um, high intensity exercise. Um, and of course, there's aerobic exercise and then there's strength training. And they're both very important. But high intensity weight training will cause you to force more mitochondria to be built in the muscle cells to give you that energy. And so that's a critical, critical factor. Um, and the heart is the most energy demanding muscle in the human body. About 70% of cardio sites, about 70% of the volume of your heart muscles are mitochondria. So there's an enormous amount of mitochondria in the heart muscle creating that muscle that beats every second of every minute of every day without a rest, hopefully. Uh, but muscles throughout your whole body are requiring energy. and so when you're exercising, you're affecting every single cell in your body. And over time, if you exercise and do strength training regularly, you're getting more mitochondria in every cell in your body. Now, the, there's another thing that was a relatively recent discovery. When you do exercise and exercise your muscles to exhaustion, your body compensates by producing a protein that brings more oxygen and more nutrients into the muscles, which accelerates muscle growth. So they're discovering that this is a new scientific discovery. At the cellular level, when you exercise muscles to the point of fatigue, the body produces this protein, which then brings more oxygen and more nutrients into the cell to compensate for that stressed fatigue, and you accelerate building stronger muscles. 
-hmm. So that's the new one of the new explanations of why high intensity um, resistance exercise is so effective because it stimulates the production of this protein, but it has to be high intensity. And there's a, a great deal of research. I'm fascinated by the physiology of exercise and they discovered, and, and I know that you know this in the last 10 years or so, high intensity interval training is phenomenal. Whether it's aerobics on an elliptical trainer or riding a bike, doing these high intensity intervals, or if you're doing something like Tabata, uh, doing 20 seconds of work and 10 seconds of rest, eight repetitions to your muscles are fatigued, that gives you much greater benefit in much shorter amounts of time. So they realize that you get about 90% of the benefit of your exercise out of the top 10% of your physical exertion capabilities. So high intensity exercise is giving you much more benefit in much less time. And in this day and age when everybody has dry, high stress lifestyles and not enough time to do things, get into high intensity exercise, you'll get much greater benefit in a shorter period of time. Love it, Ross. Now, we have a lot of listeners that are above the age of 50, and they, they frequently write in, well, I have arthritis, so I can't exercise, or I have diabetes, or I'm overweight. And here you are, 72 years old, eating organic food, doing yoga, doing CrossFit, and you're pushing your muscles to failure. What sort of motivational tips or, or what could you offer to those listeners that have these limiting beliefs that because they have a disease process or a mobility issue that they you know, shouldn't exercise? What would you tell them? Um, I would repeat that the number one factor for healthy aging is doing your exercise and anybody at any age can get involved in exercise and start to push themselves. Good physical trainers in CrossFit or in any type of sport will recognize where an individual is at and design an exercise program so that the weights they're using or the intensity that they're doing is appropriate for their age and their level of physical fitness. And you start where you're at, and then you start to push yourself. Now, the reason I particularly like CrossFit is when I go to a CrossFit class, I get pushed to a level of physical activity and physical exertion that I could never do on my own. I don't have the self-discipline to exercise that hard on my own. If I go to a class and I'm told I have to do this particular set of exercises for five rounds and I'm just almost dying with <laughs> exhaustion, and <laughs> but I do it. And, but anybody at any, any level can do this. There are women in my CrossFit classes, 23, 24 year old women that are pushing heavier weights than I do. I'm 72 years old, but exercise is not a competitive sport at this level. It's an individual thing. Start low, start slow, and, but start to push yourself. And for people that get out and walk, I see a lot of people just kind of go out for a little stroll. Get into this really pumping yourself and move 20 or 30 seconds about as fast as you can go, and then slow down a little bit. And another 60 or 90 seconds, really crank it up again and go into high intensity. The benefits are astronomical compared to just going out for a slow walk. Mm -hmm. um, so anybody can do this at any level, even home exercises. There are band, stretch bands that you can use. You can do squats. You can do push-ups and sit-ups. There are things you can do without spending a lot of money and I encourage people to get into it because it'll change their life. Absolutely. For people that are sedentary, that, when I was at the cancer hospital in Mexico as the alternative, uh, excuse me, the hospital administrator of one of the alternative hos cancer hospitals in Mexico for six years, and I used to tell my cancer patients, get out there on the beach and go for a walk and really go for it. And some people would say, well, with I, without my glasses on, I can't see. And I tell them, take your glasses off so you get your natural sunlight in your eyes. I tell them, if, if you can't see with your glasses off, just walk along the edge of the water. If your feet start to get wet, move a little bit to the right. You're getting a little too close to the ocean. But get out there, get your glasses off, and do a power walk on the beach and get your exercise. Beautifully said. And I love your practical people, approach. Even if people are in a wheelchair, 
you can sit in a wheelchair and do arm lifts and leg lifts and things. There are things that everybody of every age can do to start working their muscles and increase their strength and their physical fitness. Mm -hmm. That's Love the that. message. Beautifully said there, Ross, and you bring up wheelchair and that reminds me of, of something, as I mentioned earlier, I travel quite frequently and anymore now when you land uh, that there's six or seven, you know, staff members of the airline or airport that are wheeling off people that are in their fifties, maybe late forties, some are in their sixties or seventies and so forth, but you know, they're clearly overweight, but you know, just by walking, um, they would help lose weight. So it's, it's pretty fascinating that just because you have a mobility issue or you're overweight and you get fatigued, that people think that they just need to sit more, that that's kind of the solution is that they're, um, you know, that they don't need to do the work. But I always, you know, want to tell people like, you know, if you actually walked, you know, to get your bags, you might lose the weight and you wouldn't need the wheelchair. But of course I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that people, you know, call me judgmental or rude or whatever. But um, uh, I think your message is, is very articulate. Now, Ross, let's go back. If we could finish up here, any final thoughts on natural solutions to anxiety depression that we didn't get to talk about that you want to share well and i just want people to know there are quite a few really safe effective natural therapies for depression and anxiety so i want to publicize the fact that these natural therapies are available i covered them all in detail in my four-hour online seminar that people can sign up for and i'll give your listeners the uh, url so they can connect to that on your show notes and but i also want to make people realize how terribly damaging the long-term effects of the prescription drugs for depression and anxiety are so if there's any way you can prevent going down that road let's prevent it but also for people that are on these medications many people can effectively transition off the medications if they start to utilize the natural therapies and very gradually reduce their dose of their prescription drugs but that's the trick. The stepping down of the dosages has to be done very gradually. And I work with people on an individual basis to, to set up programs to gradually reduce their prescription medications and integrate the natural therapies. And I always ask for a consent form from the psychiatrist or the primary care physician because it's not appropriate for me to be telling people to change their medications that their doctors have ordered for them. So I always ask for a consent form from their physician in order to work with them. Mm, fascinating stuff. Now, Ross, one question that comes to mind that, that does come up a lot is should people take uh, 5 HTP or, you know, serotonin uh, precursors if they're on an SSRI? What would you say to them? Well, you have to be a little careful because there's a condition called serotonin syndrome, which happens when serotonin levels go too high and that can be pretty dangerous. So I don't advocate just cavalierly starting to take a lot of these natural therapies without appropriately starting to decrease the level of the prescription drug. So it's a little balancing act of starting to lower the dose of your prescription drug as you integrate the natural therapies into your system. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Now, Eric Braverman had a, an approach. He's the author, I think, of The Edge Effect, where he would suggest, um, you know, glutamine, I think it was a DL, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and serotonin in different ratios. This is more of like a global neurotransmission a boost, if you will, yeah. fertilizer. For uh, Do you advocate things of that sort, even for people that... Yeah, may have never taken a, a medication, but have the occasional, you know, feelings of the blues and malaise. Uh, would you suggest something like that as kind of a boost? I do. I, I, my theory is that we should optimize brain chemistry, biochemistry, and optimize our function of our bodies. And I've got thousands of studies in my database that show that levels of nutrients higher than the RDA level produce significant benefits. I think the, the RDA stands for the recommended daily allowance. I think the RDA stands for the really dumb allowance. It's got <laughs> nothing to do with optimal health and wellness. And a lot of doctors kind of criticize me when I recommend, for example, taking a thousand milligrams of vitamin C two or three or four times a day. They say, ha ha, you're making expensive urine. I always want to have extra vitamin C coming out in my urine. I always want to have more antioxidant protection than I would normally need. Because when you become stressed, all of a sudden your antioxidant needs go up astronomically. 
So you want to have extra antioxidants on board to be able to handle any kind of stress that you get exposed to. And many people don't have any idea the amount of environmental pesticides, insecticides, and toxins that are being exposed to in the food, the water, the air, the clothing they're wearing, the, the packaging for products that they're using. So you want to have higher levels of these antioxidant nutrients on hand so that your body can do the best it can to handle all of these stresses and challenges. Perfect. Beautifully said there. Um, Dr. Brownstein, I haven't heard the uh, really dumb allowance. I like that one. And, and Dr. David Brownstein, he's the author of many books as well in Michigan. He calls it uh, the RDA, Rats, Drugs, and Assumptions. So uh, pick one that sticks, that, that resonates with you and, and memorize that. So when people yeah. kind of say, oh my gosh, the RDA for vitamin D is 400 IUs. What are you doing taking 10,000 or 5,000? Uh, just remember that mnemonic there. So Ross, up to now, this has been fantastic information. And we have a couple final questions that I would love to ask you. And the first one is, you know, we know that you're 72 years old. You're the author of many best-selling books. You're doing CrossFit. Uh, right after this, you're doing a radio show. And then before you were doing a radio show, before we talk. So you're doing a lot of great things. We want to know what your morning routine is. So if you could share with us that. Well, my morning routine is that I'm a mocha addict. <laughs> so every morning I make myself a mocha, a soy mocha. I don't do regular milk. I do soy milk. And um, I'll do some fruits. I'll, I'll oftentimes make a fruit smoothie and I'll put in some freshly ground flaxseed and a scoop of uh, really good quality whey protein powder. Um, so that oftentimes is my morning routine. Or I'll frequently do some eggs. I'll make a, put in some, uh, I do a, what I call a salad buzz where I cr create a lot of uh, vegetables all kind of ground up and processed and so I'll put some of those vegetables into my omelet and mix it up and have veggies and omelet together. Uh, so that's kind of my morning routine, either a healthy omelet or uh, a good fruit smoothie and my morning mocha. Mm, love it, Ross. Fantastic. Now, if there was just one herb nutrient botanical or whole food substance for that matter, uh, you talked about glutathione, you talked about vitamin C, what would be your favorite nutrient and why? For many years, my favorite nutrient has been coenzyme Q10. I think it's the number one nutrient for life extension and anti-aging because it prevents free radical damage in your mitochondria. But now that I've learned about lactobacillus fermentum ME3 and its ability to produce glutathione in your body, that has become my number one go-to nutrient. And for your viewers and your listeners who might be interested in lactobacillus fermentum ME3, it's available in three different products that are being marketed by essential formulas. The uh, products are called Reg Active. That's R E G apostrophe A C T I V. And Reg Active is a combination of active regeneration. It's a brand name that was created in Europe, and we've kept the brand name here in the United States. And we have three Reg Active formulas we have liver and detox health, we have immune and vitality and we have cardio wellness. And all three of these Reg Active products have lactobacillus fermentum ME3, along with some supportive ingredients that are condition specific for each of the three products. And uh, I'll give you the uh, contact information for essential formulas so that people can um, call and get more information or go to your health food store or your vitamin store and ask them to get in touch with the central formulas and start carrying the regactive formulas so that they can start taking the lactobacillus fermentum ME3 on a regular basis. Sure. Yeah, we'll recommend that and put that in the show notes at highintensityhealth.com slash Ross. So great info, Ross. Now, if you could bump shoulders with Barack Obama or a future president, maybe a congressman, uh, a mayor, you know, what sort of lifestyle or health tip would you share with them in 30 seconds or less? I think maybe one of the biggest challenges for humankind right now is Roundup and glyphosate and the problems that that herbicide is causing worldwide. I make a pitch to get that out of our food supply, out of the, the environment, and at the same time, that's connected to GMO foods. So we have to eliminate GMO foods and get the herbicide Roundup out of our environment. It's doing more damage than virtually anybody realizes. I think GMO foods and the herbicide Roundup are one of the biggest um, 
damaging things that has ever been perpetrated on humanity. So it's a it's going to have tremendous long term problems that are we just right now looked at the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, that's yeah, really scary stuff. And we caught up with Stephanie Seneff to get her inside perspective on that. And that'll be posted uh, later on this fall. So Ross Pelton, I'm inspired by your work and all that you've done to help people understand how drugs deplete nutrients and how we can optimize our neurochemistry and prevent uh, anxiety and depression naturally. So I'm sure our listeners will want to reach out to you, learn a little bit more about your work. What's the best online resources for that? Uh, thanks, Mike. The best uh, online resource is my website, which is naturalpharmacist.net. And my bio and all my books and all my, my blog is there with hundreds of health-related articles. So naturalpharmacist.net is the go-to site. Perfect. Thanks again, Ross. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Great being with you, Mike. Enjoyed talking with you and look forward to connecting with you when you get to Ashland next time. Awesome. We'll go to the co-op and have a meal together. Let's do it. We'll do that for sure.